So my talk will be on uh, efficient reasoning with intentional concepts and a joint work with uh, Ricardo Gonzalez, Matthias Knorr and João Leite who uh, work in Lisbon and I work in Dortmund. Uh, so yeah, the, the goal of our talk was to give a uh, general framework for efficient reasoning based on logic programming with intentional concepts. So with um, concepts that use somehow a model operator. And the motivation for this work was the uh, observation that in the last years, there has been an increased interest in combination of logic programming with intentional concepts. For example, there are lots of papers on using uh, concepts using time. So uh, for example, before or after or during some time interval and logic programming or um, papers combining reasoning over space and logic programming, then the intentional operator would be, for example, next to or at uh, point X or Y. And there's also some work on uh, combining logic programming with deontic concepts like obligations or permissions. And kind of the setting that we will use to illustrate our framework is uh, an airport exit which consists of two gates so people enter the exit uh, at, by passing through gate alpha and then they come in a little zone in between two gates and there the temperature of the people is checked and the idea is that uh, we want to avoid people leaving through gate be uh, beta which uh, leads to the outside world uh, if the people have a fever and they didn't leave their contact dates. And so this kind of reasoning scenario would require us to, re to reason using concepts or model concepts about time and space. For example, we want to say that people are at some point or at some um, point and time, or we want to say that something happened before a time or after a time, or something is happening next to a location. So this is a reasoning context where we want some intentional concepts or model operators combined with logic programming. So just to, to uh, make the goal a bit more precise, what do we provide in the paper? Well, we provide a general framework allowing for efficient reasoning based on logic programming with intentional concepts. And we used some ideas from a paper from 92, uh, but we generalized these ideas. And how do we do this? Well, we combine logic programming under three valued semantics, which in particular will allow for the tractable well-founded semantics with neighborhood semantics, which is a very general framework for reasoning with modalities. And this reference is a very nice book about it by uh, Eric Packard. And so the first thing that I have to introduce to you is the language that we used and we uh, based our language on a function-free first-order signature and a, a set of variables. And this allows us to construct atoms, uh, which we will simply denote by this calligraphic A because the exact building up of the atoms doesn't really matter for our paper. And then because we also want some model uh, operators, we also have a set of operation symbols, which we denoted by a calligraphic O. And then we can build up what we call intentional atoms, which is a combination of a um, uh, model operator NABLA and an atom P. And then our language consists of the non-intentional atoms together with the intentional atoms. And this allows us to build up logic programming rules and logic programming rules are um, yeah, normal logic programming rules like most people know them only that we allow instead of just atoms, also intentional atoms, so atoms combined with a model operator. And so we allow for negation by failure, but we don't allow, for example, for nested modalities or for um, Boolean formulas. So disjunctions, for example, neither in the head nor the body. And here is an example of su how such a logic program could look like. For example, we could have the atoms is uh, past the gate A, has a fever, or uh, the gate opens, and then we can have the model operators, for example, that something is the case at time T and location L, or something was the case before time T. And then we can express normal logic programming rules, because we also allow for normal atoms to occur in the body, but we can also use our new intentional operators, and for example, we can express that if someone passed 
uh, true gate alpha after time t and she didn't pass after time t true gate beta then she will be at the zone in between alpha and beta uh, which we call b at the time t and of course you can make many combinations uh, so just to show you how how we can express uh, also model operators or model atoms and now these intentional operators are given a semantics through neighborhood frames and how do neighborhood frames work well the idea is that we have a pair uh, consisting of worlds and of neighborhood functions uh, and the, the worlds people probably know quite well also for example crypty frames use worlds but uh, neighborhood functions might be new so the idea is that for every modality we map every world to a set of set of worlds and what does this set of set of worlds means well um, the idea is that whenever a non-intentional atom is true in all of the worlds in such a set of worlds then the intentional atom consisting of the operator together with the non-intentional atom will be true at the world on the left hand side so i give you an example because i realize this is a very abstract definition in the scenario that we described for the airport we have some times time one time two and so on and we have three locations a b and c and then the worlds just are uh, time space points so uh, one a will be a world one b will be a world and so on now to give you an example of how the neighborhood functions work uh, we look at the operator is the case at one and a and there the neighborhood of any world of this modality consists of all the sets of worlds with worlds which includes at least one a so the singleton set containing one a will be in the neighborhood of every world of this modality but also for example this set of worlds or this set of worlds will be in the neighborhood of at one a for every world and once we have this neighborhood functions uh, we can also define semantics for um, intentional atoms and the so as i already mentioned we use a three valued semantics and so we have to define a valuation function which maps every atom to a pair of sets of worlds and the idea is that um, for an atom we have we have a pair of sets of worlds and the first um, the first set of worlds denotes the worlds in which the atom is true and the second set of worlds denotes the worlds in which the atom is not false so i is either true or undecided and because we use um you know we want to look at consistent interpretations we require that the sets of worlds in which an atom is true it's a subset of the set of worlds in which the atom is not false and then we can use the neighborhood semantics to define also for intentional atoms the denotation and there the idea is that the neighborhood of an intentional atom nabla p is the set of worlds for which the truth set of the not non-intentional atom is in the neighborhood of such a world so again a rather abstract definition i realize that uh, so here is an example again suppose that we have uh, an valuation function where s assigns um, where s is true in world c so that's expressed by this formula here and then we know that the neighborhood of the at one c is um, all of the worlds which all of the sets of worlds which contains at least one c so we know that this set of worlds is in the neighborhood so we see that for every world at one gamma is also uh, true so that's how we uh, interpret intentional atoms in our setting and then this allows us to to define stable models for programs and there the idea is actually just the same as for normal logic programs so we first calculate a reduct and then we check if an interpretation is a minimal model of its own reduct only now we calculate the reduct at every world omega uh, sorry at every world w so instead of just calculating one reduct we have to calculate for every world in our neighborhood frame a reduct 
So just a reminder how reducts are calculated. To calculate the reduct of a program P for an interpretation I at the world W, we check for every rule uh, of this form. If uh, the world is, if the world is not in the truth, in, is not fall, sorry, uh, if for no negated atom, the negated atom is true or undecided at the world W, then we just take the rule, the positive part of the rule and put it in the reduct. If on the other hand, none of the negated atoms are true, but at least some of them are undefined at the world W, then we take the positive part of the rule, uh, but we also add the undecided constant to it. And if none of these two cases are uh, applicable, then we just throw out the rule. And so we do this for every world. So how it is look, for example, for this rule, we have the rule that the gate B opens if uh, a person P is at the location and she doesn't have a fever. And we see, for example, in the interpretation, uh, in this example, that person P has a fever at location C, but not at B then the reduct at location C would be empty because we throw out this rule because fever is true, but the reduct at location B would contain the positive part of the rule in question. Okay, and now we know how to calculate the reduct at every world. We can define the stable models. Um, well, almost. First, I have to define what it means for um, an interpretation to satisfy a positive rule and a positive program. So um, a rule of this form, so a positive rule is satisfied at the world if it, if the if the all of the atoms in the body are true at the world, then also the atom in the hat will be true at this world. Um, yeah, so it's basically just like a normal logic programming, only that now we have to check again at every world if the, if the rule is satisfied. And then we define two um, orderings on the over interpretations. The first one is the truth ordering and the second one is the knowledge ordering. And once we defined also these orderings, we can finally define stable models. And we say that an interpretation I is a stable model of a program P if um, for every world in the neighborhood, uh, in the neighborhood frame, the interpretation satisfies the reduct of the program at this world. And there is no interpretation that has this property and is um, true or makes true less than the interpretation. So this is recalled the, the truth ordering over interpretations. So again, this is a generalization of the normal pro logic programming semantics, only now that we have to look again at every world. And in fact, we could show that our model notion is faithful um, to partial stable models of normal logic programs. So three valued stable models of normal logic programs, if we consider a program without intentional atoms. So it, it really is a generalization of the stable models. And to further check that our definitions made sense, we proved some more properties of stable, which hold for normal logic programs and stable model semantics. And for this, we had to make some assumptions on the operators. The first assumption that we had to make was that the operators are monotonic. So I have a motivating example here. If you're interested, we can walk through it in the Q and A, but um, I won't go it through, through it now for time reasons. But uh, an intentional operator is monotonic in a frame if for any two interpretations, if the first interpretation makes less atoms true than the second interpretation, we also have that the denotation of the operator over any atom will be a, a subset of the denotation of the, of the atom, sorry, the denotation of the operator and the atom for the second interpretation. So the idea is that if um, one interpretation, if the denotation of non-intentional atoms grows between two interpretations, 
then the denotation of the intentional atoms will also grow. And this uh, monoton monotonicity of operators, we had to assume to prove that um, stable models are always minimal in the sense that we can have no two stable models for which the first one makes two um, less atoms than the second one. So this was at first a bit a surprising uh, result maybe, or but uh, yeah, if, if you are interested in, we in this, we can talk about the example. The second assumption we had to make was that operators are deterministic. And this means that uh, the intersection of the neighborhood is in the neighborhood for any world um, W and any operator. And this is basically to avoid that um, a program can have, a positive program can have one, more than one unique, uh, more than one minimal model. So if we would allow for non-deterministic operators, this would be a bit uh, similar to allowing for this junction in the head of programs. And then we could end up with more than one minimal model for a positive program. And uh, this might be interesting, but in this paper, we wanted to restrict our attention to the simplest case. And indeed, if we assume that a positive program is, um, has only rules which use operators which are deterministic in the head of the rule, then uh, we can prove that any positive program has a unique stable model. Okay, so now I can finally come back to um, the goal of the paper, with, which was to define uh, um, formalism, which allows for efficient reasoning. And for this, we defined the well-founded interpretation and the idea is again the same as in normal logic programming. So we take just the knowledge minimal stable model of an intentional logic program. And then we can show if, we, if uh, the program is deterministic in the head and every operator is monotonic, then we have a unique well-founded model. So this is again a generalization of the things that people know about the well-founded model for normal logic programming. Yeah, and to show this, we had to devise an alterna alternating fixed point construction as usual. Um, but to define the syntactic procedure, we had to make use of labeled formulas, which express that uh, an intentional atom is the case at some world. So we had to, to um, make some changes to the syntax to make everything work also syntactically. And then we needed some additional operators. So normally you just have the immediate consequence operator, but now we needed some additional operators to make sure that all of the information uh, about the worlds and model operators is treated adequately, adequately. Finally, I can come to the complexity of reasoning. So um, for stable models, we have the following complexity results. I won't uh, go through all of the results now, but I think the most important result that we have in view of our goals is that uh, computing the well-founded model is p-complete. So we have, in this sense, we can really claim that we have efficient reasoning with intentional concepts. And we also showed that some of the papers that I mentioned in the beginning can, uh, can at least be, or the works in these papers can at least be partially captured by our formalisms. For example, we can capture plain Lars programs uh, as intentional logic programs. And uh, we are working now on uh, representing Italis, which is another framework for logic program based reasoning with time. So to conclude, uh, intentional logic programs allow us for the feasible reasoning with intentional concepts in a general way. And the three valued semantics provide an alternative semantics for many of the existing formalisms, which I mentioned, because most of them use two two-valued stable semantics or something derived from this two-valued stable model semantics. And the nice thing about having this three-valued semantics is that we, the well-founded model can be defined and we shown that under uh, basic assumptions it can be computed in polynomial time. In future work, we plan to generalize this to first order programs and allow for nested non-monotonic and non-deterministic operators and perhaps to integrate this with description logics. So this concludes my talk and I'm happy to take any questions.
uh, uh, to the full screen. I'm going to uh, discuss about a neological system for normative reasoning, which I call discursive input output logic. Uh, it is a unification of modal logic uh, and the norm based approaches in the ontic logic. Uh, I will discuss the core idea of modal logic approach, uh, I mean, quantification and the more general uh, de uh, developed formulation criterion framework. Uh, and then I go to the an opponent approach, detachment approach that is a shared idea with. Uh, with the non-monotonic reasoning and input output logic framework. And uh, I would uh, discuss why I call it this logic discursive input output logic and introduce uh, the semantical uh, unification. But modal logic approach is based on analogy between uh, necessity, obligation, and uh, possibility and permission. We have a set of accessible world. Uh, we order them, we order them uh, by using a better nurse relation or an, an goodness, uh, goodness relation, and we, de we decide about what out to be or what out to do by looking at these uh, ideal words. On the other hand, there is uh, a more recent approach, but maybe the philosophical motivations come back to the 60 uh, uh, or earlier, such as uh, jargon and dilemma that, uh, that is about when norms does not discuss about truces how we can reason uh, about them. And this is the fundamental uh, problem uh, of the ontic logic that is the title of uh, McKinson. And McKinson with Van der Torre tried to de develop a new logic called the input output logic. Uh, in this logic, the ontic operator are evaluated not with reference to a set of possible, but with reference to a set of uh, norms. And here the, uh, the focus is more on the inference patterns. Okay, for the uh, representative framework of um, uh, model logic, I focused on the criterion framework. Uh, the Kratzer contribution is more on the semantical side. Uh, she introduced two kinds of uh, functions, evaluation functions from uh, evaluation, uh, two kinds of uh, conversational backgrounds functions from evaluation world to set of propositions. Model based determines the set of accessible words and ordering source induce the ordering on the words. By combining these uh, two functions and doing quantification, universal quantification and existential quantification, we could drive our obligation and our permission. Here, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to keep the contextual component from this criterion framework and uh, use another derivation uh, system as detachment instead of quantification. We, if we show that how, how much this is more flexible for driving differences of obligation and permissions. The detachment, uh, detachment syntactical looks like a modest ponens, but uh, it appears in uh, the ontic paradoxes such as a Chisholm scenario. But also we look at, we can look at it uh, more semantically. This is the way that uh, we, uh, we, discuss, uh, we introduce the semantics of input output logic. We could uh, interpret the X is oblig obligatory if A as X can be detached in context A. And uh, for driving our obligation, we define output operations that receive a set of explicitly given norms this is the, our normative systems and a set of inputs. And uh, these output operations give us uh, uh, some different kind of algorithm process for, det uh, for detaching different kind of obligation and permission. And uh, in, instead of just two kinds of quantification, I mean, uh, compatibility or entitlement, here we can introduce a family of uh, the, uh, output operations uh, that uh, in some cases does not suffer from some bad logical properties such as monotonicity of uh, conclusion. But here, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to focus on the detachment in the in discursive context. In a discourse, we can represent the context by a modal base or an ordering source in, in, the, in the criterion for framework or uh, interested in the linguistics. 
And these two uh, functions, uh, the difference is that model-based functions represent the factual information con and consistent information. And then the, uh, there is inconsistency in the information. We could look at this as an ordering source. And the idea here is that we try to manipulate these output operations uh, over these model-based or ordering sources. So in a sense, we need to move, uh, build this, um, output operations over algebraic models and uh, interestingly, uh, Boolean algebra. This, this is the, the main uh, semantical construct that we are focusing here. Okay, but input output logic, what is the difference? Uh, the main uh, distinctive future of input output logic is that you start from a set, a set of explicitly given norms. We have a set of, we have a normative systems and we have a, a set of inference rules that uh, we could drive new rules from uh, that such, such as stringing of the input, weakening of the output, conjunction of the output. And in the literature, there are two kinds, generally, there are two kinds of uh, input-output logic. Unconstrained input-output logic that just we use these inference rules. And also we have the constrained input-output logic that we do consistency check with uh, some constraint in our uh, in the leaves of our proof tree, and it brings our our uh, logical reasoning very close to the AGM theory, and we could discuss about contributive problems. And uh, as you see, we could characterize these different uh, different uh, uh, proof systems by using, as we accepted, uh, output operations. For example, in the basic output, we could uh, also discuss about the reason by cases. For the reusable output, we use again the, our output as inputs our, in our reasoning. These core systems are introduced by McKinson and Van der Sore in, in, the, in the philosophical logic paper. But the point here is that, as you see, they build this logic or propositional logic. And also we can see that we could uh, build this, uh, this input output framework or intuitionistic logic. It was another paper. But the idea here that I'm trying to build this input output logic more abstractly over uh, algebraic settings. So we moved from uh, a logic, uh, the logical setting to uh, algebraic setting. Uh, and for this is important because we want to make connections to uh, uh, model logic uh, semantics. Uh, so it is very useful if we could build these IO operations over Boolean algebra. And by using the representation theorems, actually we could manipulate a set of possible words. And the question here is that what is the algebraic counterpart of consequence relation? Because if we use an algebraic uh, counterpart for, uh, for the consequence relation, we could actually define these output operations in our algebraic set. And there is a purpose of Gabe, Parent, and Van der Torre that they use upward close set of an upward of the infimum of uh, infimum element of a set. But here, uh, the, the result is uh, just for out, uh, one simple-minded output operations. But here, uh, I had the observation that if we use upward operator that just that is not closed under and, uh, we could actually again define all the previously studied output operations. But the difference is that uh, we should remove the and from our proof systems. And uh, interesting is that our logical system is uh, non adjunctive. It's, it is a form of per consistent logic. In this new out out input output logic, if phi is an input and psi also is an input, we cannot, uh, uh, we, we, do, we does not accept phi and psi as an input. Actually, here we are sensitive to the uh, sort so of information. Suppose that I'm discussing. I received a comment from my supervisor to write a, a report tonight. And also my wife uh, told me that she want to invite our friends tonight. So I, I, I can discuss uh, with both of them, but in a sense that this information are inconsistent. I should receive them and derive my obligation, my permission and decide what uh, I should have to do. This is why we call this uh, logical framework discursive or input out uh, discursive or non-adjunctive input output logic. Uh, 
As you see, we can, by using the algebraic operator, we could define more fine-grained uh, output operation. And this is also important later that we see that for, we could, by using these more basic output operations, we could define much more complex uh, output operation by looking at the uh, property of reversibility of inference rules. So here, uh, we, uh, we could, uh, in this more fine-grained uh, semantics, we could just have a semantics for a syringing of uh, input or weakening of the output. But the, the, the main point of this, um, this uh, family of uh, proof system is that they don't have AND. Now we are, uh, it seems that we deconstruct this input-output logic uh, semantical construction. Now we are interested to again, uh, added and to our semantics. It is, it is, uh, uh, this is a similar idea to the model logic. We defined some output operations for deriving permission. Now we are interested to come back again and derive, uh, define some output operation for deriving obligation. And all this is also due, we could do this by due to nice property of our proof systems. This is an observation from McKinson and Van der Torre that we could uh, reverse the order of inference rule. For example, if uh, we could reverse the order of rule of AND with a syringing of antecedent and, uh, and weakening of the output. So in the proof system that we have these three rules, I could uh, uh, put the AND rule just at the end. At the end. So uh, we know that the system how behave uh, without these rules. So I have a characterization, characterized output uh, for this one, and I do transitive closure just for um, uh, characterizing the system with AND. In this way, we could define much uh, more uh, new logical systems. And also we could uh, again construct uh, the four main proof systems that we had uh, uh, that was introduced by Mackinson and Torre for uh, reasoning about the obligations. Okay, now I'm going to uh, actually introduce the, this semantical unification, why we say also this is the semantical unification. Uh, as you see, in, in the actual world, we could represent the, the, the model based, uh, actually the, or the factual uh, information that is delivered by the by model based function. This, this formation are necessary and we could put, uh, and consistent, we could uh, do a conjunction over them. And since this output operation is built on the Boolean algebra with using representation theorem, we could, I could uh, put this, uh, uh, this set of information as an input in our, uh, inside of our output operations. And we have two kinds of output, one for deriving permission and one for deriving obligation similar to the box and diamond. And, and also more nicely, when, they, when in, the, in the actual world, we have a different kind of possibility. We have uh, a sort of uh, inconsistent information. We could uh, put, uh, do, find the, max, uh, the maximum value of them and put them as an input in our uh, output operations. Now I'm going to uh, explain this in an, in an example. This is the minor paradox that discuss um, in, in the philosophy, uh, there are, te there are ten, main, uh, 10 minors in, in shaft A or shaft B, but we don't know which shaft there is a flow. We have enough sandbags to block one shaft, but not both. If we block one shaft, all the water will go into the other shaft, killing any miner inside it. If we block neither shaft, both shafts will fill halfway with water and just one min miner in the lowest in the shaft will be killed. And in this scenario, we can see that these four sentences are true. Either the miners are in shaft A or in shaft B. If the miners are in shaft A, we should block shaft A. If the miners are in shaft B, we should block shaft B. And we see that we should block neither shaft. This is because if, if we do mistake, all the miners will be die. And uh, if we block the right shaft, all the people will remain, remain alive. But in this case that we don't know, it is better that we do nothing because in this case, nine of them will be remains alive. 
the, the, the problem is that how we could uh, formally and logically represent these uh, four sentences. There are practical analysis to people discuss that here we have two kinds of obligation, objective obligation and subjective obligation. The sentence four is actually an objective obligation and sentence two and three are subjective. But the problem here is that there is not much clear bond between this objectivity and subjectivity. We could have a variety of obligation between these two kinds of obligations. Also, this is not allowed by the baseline algorithm of Kratzerian. If, if uh, suppose that we have a model base and uh, an ordering source, the, uh, the set W is among the best words that uh, satisfy that you should not like middle shaft A and middle shaft B. By receiving the, uh, the new information that the, uh, the minus in shaft A, this word does not entail that you should like shaft A. For you know, actually, you need to uh, change the ordering source. So, so you need to use multi uh, multiple ordering sources. That is a little bit counterintuitive. But we see that in our uh, construction, we could uh, actually use just one ordering source. We could look at the information in two ways. If the information are factual and consistent. Actually, this is our knowledge that uh, they are in shaft A or shaft B. What we derive is that we should not block shaft A or we should not block shaft B. But when we look at the information as a uh, inconsistent information, this is a possibility that uh, possibility that the, the miners are in shaft A and also the, this is a possibility that the miners are in shaft B. Uh, we we derive that we should uh, we derive all the sentences. This is uh, a kind of semantical difference with the current. Uh, approach. And also, as a plus, uh, by using this constraint input output logic, when you, are, you have updated that the miners are in shaft A, you could uh, derive that you should just block this shaft A. Okay, so what I did, I tr I've tried to uh, the define the, uh, I defined the discourse input output logic in, uh, instead of quantification, I used attachment. So we use this modal based function and ordering source function from Kratzerian framework and we use this detachment approach that is that shares idea from non monotonic logic from input uh, input output logic to define a, a semantical constructions. We, for this, we define two, co two kinds of output operations, one, one for driving permission and one for driving obligation. And there is an interesting result that is that we could build, uh, build this IO framework on top of any abstract logic. This is the idea that we could uh, use this uh, uh, rule-based reasoning on top of any logic, more interesting if on top of first order logic or description logic. This is why, because we moved from Boolean algebra and from to lattices, heighting algebra and consequence relation. Also, uh, as a further work, we could uh, uh, implement this logical, uh, in this in new input output logic in, in Isabel Hall and uh, translate them into higher order logic and uh, implement in Isabel Hall. This was the first motivation to build input output logic instead of a syntactical, uh, syntactical, uh, instead of a syntactical semantics to uh, an algebraic semantics, because in this way you could uh, actually implement the logic and use the SAT solvers and theorem progress. We hope to uh, receive, uh, give a full characterization of the rule based logic that you, you added some rules to the logic and do reasoning over the. Also, I'm thinking that we could do more uh, philosophical. Uh, reasoning by using this unified logical framework because now the ex uh, we have much more expressivity. We could use the composability property from logic about time and space and we could use the revision operator from non monotonic side uh, to revise the normative systems. And also because and since these logical systems can, can be built on top of different logical systems, it seems that it could, uh, uh, we could use it uh, over uh, different kind of knowledge bases. And also, since this input output is used for different kind of applications, such as multi-agent systems, security, and rational architecture, we are, we are thinking that we could use this logic now again uh, for in this domain, because this logic now is more agentive and can be used for the discursive uh, reasoning. Uh, thanks for your attention. It was uh, my talk.
uh, this is today's my talk is about how to apply cross uh, theories of models uh, to construct the deontic non monotonic inference and then I will try to very briefly to go to say uh, some some of the basic idea uh, of uh, how to instantiate uh, the Kratzer's deontic logics in uh, uh, formal argumentation. So this is a joint work with Bayes Radio and Leon van der Tor. And so the first things I, I want to mention is uh, why uh, we want to use Kratzer's theories here. So actually Kratzer's theories is uh, very, uh, have a very close relation uh, about uh, with the concept of a minim, um, minimal minimality in non monotonic uh, logic. So there's already talk about there uh, Mark, by Markinson in his paper in 1993 that there are many phase of minimality uh, exists in non monotonic logic, like uh, in belief revisions or in uh, by the uh, by uh, updating. Uh, but actually, uh, in uh, 1981, Process already uh, developed he, her, her theories of modality, uh, mo mo modality uh, which is a follow-up of uh, Louis' idea of counterfactual. So uh, Process theories, Process linguistic theories is quite, uh, is based on the very uh, fundamental, theoret uh, fundamental theoretical uh, base uh, 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 in the uh, Lewis semantics. And so this linguistic theories, actually uh, we can see from the days uh, when it developed, it is predates other use of minimality in AI or KR uh, community, uh, like the uh, idea of how to uh, analyze uh, belief with, uh, minimality in belief vision by the HM theories or the other uh, uh, notion of minimality in non monotonic logic. So today's outline is because I focus on the ontic logic, I will first say about uh, why we uh, want to use cross theories. That's reason, the reason is there are some conflicts uh, occurs in uh, standard the ontic logic. Uh, here's the abbreviation of SDL. And the second, I will uh, talk about the basic concepts in gradual modality. And here, um, I, will, uh, I will spend most of my time to explain uh, why I we think that uh, Kratzer's theories is important because uh, her, uh, she explained uh, very clear how we develop or how we categorize uh, modality uh, in a compositional way. And then I will go uh, very briefly about how to define Kratzer's uh, non monotonic inference in the ontic logic. Uh, because the basic idea is already uh, uh, explained in, uh, in the previous session about what, what is process modality. And then I will talk about uh, very, also very briefly about how to instantiate process, process ASPI um, aspect in formal argumentation. And in the conclusion, I will talk about uh, what is the connection between process deontic logic or the anti-inference to, uh, to our formal argumentation. So we first, uh, I, will, I will talk about one example which is quite famous in uh, the ontic logic, uh, why there is uh, some conflicts uh, occurs in the ontic, uh, in the, the ontic concept uh, context. Uh, this is the very famous uh, Sherholm's paradox, uh, a variant of it, which is analyzed by uh, uh, Parkin and Sager in 1996. And there was four, uh, net, uh, four statement or four sentence in natural language. The first is say that John and Kevin should not meet. Maybe they are not good friends, so they should not meet together. And if they meet, they should be forced to embrace because this is a good manner in the culture. And actually they meet, uh, however, we, we all also notice that uh, John and Kevin cannot be forced to embrace if they do not meet. And this four uh, uh, model sentence in natural language can be uh, formalized uh, in uh, the ontic logic by the, uh, in, in some model formulas, like uh, use the modality, uh, O for obligation, the box for 
some uh, counterfactual. Uh, for, uh, for, for example, uh, some strict uh, impl uh, implication in, uh, the, uh, in the literature. And by using some axioms in uh, a variant of uh, uh, SDL, actually that's an equivalent system of it, and we can find that use some axioms uh, and also this four uh, model formula, there's a true uh, conclusion there, which is uh, given that uh, John and Kevin met and if they meet, uh, met, met uh, they should be forced to embrace, then we know that they, sh they should embrace. And the second is that given the uh, premises saying that uh, John and Kevin should not meet, and also another premises saying that if they are, do not meet, they should not, Im uh, they, they, they do not uh, force to embrace. Then we get that they ought not uh, to embrace because if it ought not meet, there is, there is no way that they embrace uh, the others. And in standard ontic logic, this O E and O not E, they are conflict because the uh, axioms, uh, the, the axiom which talk about consistency. Okay, so now we see that given a set of premises uh, and in standard deontic logic, uh, there is conference occurs and how they happens here. And uh, the, the question now is, how can we solve it? What is the way that we can analyze this example? So first we uh, go to Kraus's theory. Kraus's theory is talk about the model sentence. Uh, she said uh, each model sentence is constructed into three uh, components. The first is the, just like uh, Ali said before, uh, it is constructed uh, with, uh, conversational background and uh, some model particle. And then also this sentence, the sentence which uh, is uh, uh, scoped by the model modality. And the most important thing uh, she um, uh, proposed is um, in the conversational background, when we uh, talk some model sentence uh, in the discourse, uh, the model base and the other ordering source is very important to decide whether this sentence is true or not. And the model base is used to decide which accessible word uh, can be used or, or, or sorry, uh, can uh, the model base decide which assumptions uh, are put it, uh, uh, put it on the accessible words. And the ordering source is, is used to induce a preference. Usually uh, what crosses, um, what crosses Propose here is a lexical uh, ordering. We will see in uh, the presentation below. So if we use uh, the we we use the uh, f to be uh, uh, to represent a function for the model base and g as the functions for the ordering sources. That each uh, model sentence, uh, the semantics of it can be defined as follow. So uh, if uh, it must be a uh, five must be the case uh, at the state W if and only if um, the best state def uh, defined by the model base and the uh, ordering sources uh, is the five states. This is a very natural uh, semantics like what we have already know from model logic. And here the most important thing is that the way you define the, uh, the best states is uh, decided by the conversational background and in which the preference over this, the, uh, the, the, about how to select the best states is uh, mostly decided by the ordering sources. There's a lot of way to define it uh, in the literature and she uh, provides some and Horty also defines some in uh, his paper in 2014. And so now how uh, process or Horty define the ordering sources uh, and how, how, or in other, in other words, how is an order, ordering sources decide, uh, how does uh, ordering sources decide a preference over uh, possible words? So if we say that a possible word U is at least as good as uh, a possible word uh, S, if at all, uh, according to the um, 
ordering sources G at the particular point W. If and only if uh, all the, um, uh, if, I, if the U, U, uh, all of the propositions true at U world is also true at S world. Uh, so it means that, um, so the, the world which is better, it contains more information. So in the Deontay concept, it's just like one more ideal world, it contains more norms than the others. So in Horty's paper in 2014, and uh, he compares Crosser's com compositional semantics, de develops some uh, inference, and, and then compares this inference with uh, the, uh, the other inference in the four theories, uh, which is one uh, particular theories in non monotonic uh, logic. Um, so let's see how this uh, process uh, ordering sources can order order the possible worlds. So given so given that there was four possible worlds W one W two W zero W one W two and W three in which we do not assume to put uh, we do not assume any assumption for uh, for the possible world, uh, which one we can assess. So we can assess all of the possible worlds. And then the ordering sources uh, recognize that um, the proposition J, which means that the justice exists, and also the proposition A means um, uh, there is something should be uh, fixed in this world, or not A, uh, there's nothing need to be fixed uh, this world. And there's these three propositions, they are, uh, they, they, it, this ordering sources recognize it. And then it can be, uh, draw, it can be, uh, it springs, uh, the situation is like this. So there's four possible world, and then the world w zero and W1 say, says that this is a, they are adjusted world. So no one is treated unjust, injustice. But W2 and W3 saying that there's someone is treated injustice. And then if there, uh, in this justice world and non-justice world, it's possible that uh, uh, this kind of behavior is a mandate of uh, there is some compensation happen or not. And um, and uh, because of the because of the ordering sources recognize that uh, justice uh, recognize justice and recognize uh, uh, recognize uh, the compensation and no compensation, they are they are equally the same or in difference. And then now we can we can calculate in a justice world where uh, there's no compensation, what we can know from this here. And first, uh, we can see that the the preference given uh, by Crosser's theories is uh, it is refreshed is satisfied with that reflexivity. So uh, we can see that W0 is uh, as, at least as good as W0. Uh, and the second thing is that we can, we can see that uh, W2 and w, W2 is, uh, uh, W1 is at least as, I, uh, w, W1 is at least as, uh, ideal as W2 and W3, W0 is at least as good as W3. And, and because uh, in the world W0 and W1, they are both have more information. Uh, 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 they, they have more information than, uh, oh, sorry, I, 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 I make a, Oh, I'm just here. Um, uh, they have more information. Okay, sorry. I, I'm a, mis a mistake in the slides. Um, I, I should say in the other way around. No matter how uh, this is the, in the, in, at the end, the calculation is that at W0, we can see that because uh, this justice world always contains more information. And we already see that the more the world contain more information, it is more ideal. So we will, we, we can see that uh, W1 and W0 are the best world. 
and then they add this row only the proposition that just exists, uh, uh, exists there. So uh, we say that uh, justice must exist. Okay, this is the way. So uh, we can see that we how to how we how we how we ranking the possible words by the number of informations um, in each possible word. This is the basic idea of Kratos uh, ordering sources and how it define a preference or a priority. Another contribution of, uh, of our paper here is we generalize the idea because it, in Kratos theories or in Horty's theories, it handle it it, 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 it it talk about the preference over propositions. But now we we lifting this um, instead of saying a preference over a possible word, we talk about preference over propositions, which is a set of possible words. Usually we say uh, a the true of a proposition, the true of a proposition is a set of states, a set of possible words. So we lift in this idea here, but we follow the constructions that are offered by Hottie and Quartus. And the second is we still order the, pre uh, the propositions lexically. Follow, uh, this is uh, how we uh, still maintain the construction there. And the last thing is the way that we lexically uh, uh, order the proposition is based on the idea of hypothesis usually used in non-monotonic uh, logic. So we think that some uh, conclusions which uh, come from the, uh, some conclusion which come from a firm premises or, or a background information is uh, more, is more, uh, uh, contain more firm information than the one that uh, just have uh, uncertain or uh, defeasible premises or information. And in this case, uh, we combine uh, Quartus theories, how do we uh, re uh, order the propositions by the way they uh, divide. So we have four kinds of variations uh, in the logic firm, which means that they only divide, uh, the conclusion only or the proposition only divides from uh, all the firm background information. Uh, the second is uh, plausible derivation, which always uh, can let us know uh, which same, uh, which proposition is divided by some uh, uncertain primers. Maybe it also contains some firm primers there. And the third is the some strict uh, derivation, which is always used it, all the conclusion, uh, all the proposition is divided in the uh, most weakest logic uh, in the, uh, in weakest logic. So it's also kind of the strongest because, because it always has the minimal information in the, uh, this, this proposition divide based on some minimal information or minimal inference rule. And defeasible derivation, which is the proposition divided from some uh, upper logic or kind of uh, the, 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 the uh, extensions from the weakest logic. So it can, this, uh, proposition uh, has to be defined based on more information, which is come from some defeasible, uh, defeasible rule. So we can now we can uh, categorize all the propositions based on different kinds of uh, uh, derivation, and this can be ranking by Kratos theories. And we always think that uh, uh, the there the proposition divided by a firm and straight derivation because it always uses the background information and the weakest logic and then it is uh, the strongest and and then uh, the firm and straight uh, and the firm and defeasible derivation uh, give a, a divide the proposition I'm, which is I'm the sorry I'm okay. sorry we need to convene to some point of uh, ending this because we are running out of time. Please okay. do something about so, this. Um, Thank you. One minute, is that okay? Okay. Okay, so then we can, we can rank in the uh, information by direction. So then we can uh, have, fi find out the maximum consistent subset of the formulas 
uh, regarding of this cross series from the from the weakest uh, direction to the strongest uh, well, sorry from the strongest to the weakest one and in the sense that you always have to uh, be consistent with the the or the direction from the way it is and also the previous strongest one and then we just use the very standard non monotonic uh, methods to cons uh, to de define the inference or the conclusion uh, con or the consequence like the skeptical inference or the uh, credulous inference this is quite standard methods and uh, it was uh, it was the first discussed by the Brazens. and one of the contribution of this word is uh, this inference we def uh, def define here, it answers the questions asked by Hardy in 2014 and how to apply process model fears to define uh, non monotonic inference. He leave it as the open questions and I hope that we answered it kindly. Uh, and then we can use the same methods to instantiate uh, formal argumentation. And this is a quite standard approach, so I skip it. And so the conclusion is that we uh, follow Hottie's theories and provide a model analy uh, analyze on norm uh, normative reasoning based on process theories and it clarify how we can construct or define a preference and then to uh, and then construct the non monotonic inference based on uh, process theories. And we also can use the uh, same methods to uh, instantiate uh, SP and we have some repre representation theory theorems to connect uh, the non monotonic inference with the uh, with the formal argumentation. And so this is the end of the talk. So thanks.